Welcome everyone. Uh, good afternoon, evening for those of you that may be on a different time zone from us. Uh, it does take a minute to load in these Zoom webinars, so please bear with us as we load everyone up. But big thank you for joining us today. Look forward to answering lots of questions. Uh, wonderful to see all of you, or at least see your names on a participant list. And we do uh, have a few hundred people here today, so it will take us a moment to load all of you in. Uh, so thank you for your patience uh, as we are adding folks in. It's also very fun. I see at least one name of a student who I know has been admitted to the program that I teach in. So that's really fun uh, when I get to recognize names as they go by. Welcome to all of you um, and give us a, a moment as things load in, but really wonderful to have such great attendance today. Uh, so welcome again, we are loading everyone in. I wanna make sure you know if you need it, there is a live transcript available uh, and I encourage you to click on that at the bottom of the Zoom uh, if you need that. And Derek, if we could type that into the chat as well, that would be great. Uh, welcome everyone to our first of two town halls for incoming graduate students here at UCI. I'm Jillian Hayes. I have the privilege of being Dean of the Graduate Division, which means I get to be in charge of all the grad students on campus to the degree anyone can be in charge of grad students. Uh, so I'm very excited to uh, introduce you all to a wonderful panel. But before I do, I just want to start with a few opening remarks. So first of all, we are so excited to have you here to be part of our anteater family um, that we so, uh, affectionately refer to you all as grad eaters. I do occasionally get the question of what does that mean? Are they eating the grad students? Um, and you will learn over time to do a proper zot, which Connor was uh, demonstrating for us. It took me several years of being here at UCI before I perfected mine, so don't worry if you aren't quite there yet. Um, we are doing these town halls because there is so much change and there is so much uncertainty and we know how difficult it is for you. Some of you are choosing where to go to grad school having never set foot on the campuses that you are thinking about now spending somewhere between one and maybe eight years of your lives. And that's really a remarkable thing to try to do. So I wanna congratulate you all on your admissions. Uh, that means that you are excellent. Uh, we don't admit students who aren't excellent. So congratulations, you're wonderful and also condolences on trying to make these tough decisions on where you're gonna go and what you're gonna do with the next year. Hopefully we can provide you some answers today. And if not, at least we can point you in the direction of some folks who may have some answers for you. Um, I do encourage you to, even as the panelists who I'm gonna to turn to in a moment to introduce themselves, even as they're doing introductory remarks, feel free to put questions into the Q&A and we will take those uh, eventually, probably not immediately, but keep loading them in. Uh, and you can also upvote on other people's questions and so on. Uh, this is the moment where if I was teaching a class, I would tell them the same thing I tell you, which is if you have a question, the chances are very good that someone else has a question as well. So please go ahead and ask it and ask it doubly important to ask it for those people who may be watching this later on a recording and they weren't here to ask the questions themselves. You are doing a service to those folks. So Thank you. Um, probably the biggest question we are getting right now is, are we going to be in person in fall? And this is the moment where I tell you it is Tuesday, March 30th, 2021 at 3.05 p.m. And as of right now, I can tell you strongly, yes, uh, graduate courses will be in person in the fall. The reason I am caveating that with the time and date is that things happen. If, if one thing that COVID has taught us is that we are need to be prepared for things that we never thought we could be prepared for. We need to be prepared for the unpredictable. And it may be that something happens between now and August or now in September, depending on when you're meant to arrive here, that mixes that up. But as of right now, things are looking very good for our campus. Things are looking very good for our county. And we strongly believe that our graduate courses will be here in person with all appropriate precautions. And we're very excited. I can't tell you how much we have missed having our students on campus. 
Um, the other big questions we get are about funding. If you are a PhD student or a Master of Fine Arts student, those that we refer to as terminal degrees, you should have a funding package with your acceptance. If you have any uh, concerns about that or you don't think you have one, I will encourage you to email the grad applicant email address that someone will be listening to me right now and nicely put into the chat box for us, and we can look into that. If you are not in one of those programs that has a guaranteed funding offer, things are much more diverse for you. And there are a lot of options, uh, and we'll talk through some of those options throughout the, the day today, potentially if you have specific questions, but they might be research assistantships, teaching assistantships, fellowships, and all kinds of other things. And then finally, the other big question that we tend to get a lot of is about housing and about professional development. And luckily for you, we have uh, some wonderful experts here who will talk about those things when we get there, as well as a wonderful expert around the issues that we do to ensure the wellness, health, safety of our uh, students here. So I'm going to introduce our panelists now, uh, and I'm just so glad to have them here. So let me call first on one of you, uh, or soon to be one of you, which is Connor Strobel, who is your president of the Associated Graduate Students and is uh, the elected representative who makes sure that graduate student interests are represented at all levels of campus. Over to you, Connor. All right, thank you. Thank you for uh, sparing them more of my, my, my dribblings. Uh, but hi, everyone. My name is uh, Connor Strobel. I'm a graduate student in the sociology department. I'm the AGS president, which, uh, as Dean Hayes said, is the graduate student government. So we do a variety of different sort of advocacy and programmatic work on campus at the system-wide level with our uh, the other nine UC campuses, as well as uh, local, state, and federal government. So um, I look forward to, as the conversations uh, go on today and uh, the questions to talk to more about sort of the different kinds of cool support programs and professional development programs that we do in conjunction uh, or in, in supplement to uh, the work that Grad Division and the other partners do as well. Thank you so much, Connor. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand over to Marcel, who can speak to some of our campus-wide uh, initiatives to really support you once you're here. Great. Welcome, everybody. I do have a PowerPoint that hopefully we can put up on the screen, or unless we're just doing hellos right now, but I think we're doing the doing my little spiel. So um, your spiel. Will, can we get right. that PowerPoint up? Thank you. Great. But hi, everybody. My name is uh, Dr. Marcel Hayashida. I am the uh, Associate Vice Chancellor for Wellness, Health, and Counseling. Uh, I have my PhD in clinical psychology. Um, so remember very much sometime in the last uh, century uh, going to graduate school. Um, so I'll start first with the Counseling Center, the next, uh, the next slide, please. And then I'm gonna go through this very quickly and I'm happy to take questions at the end of this. This will be a, a super quick surface dive through all of this. Um, what I wanna emphasize here is that our services are free Okay, we are really lucky to be in Southern California where there are lots of very talented psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers in the area. And if we feel there's a need for some ongoing care, we, we may refer you off campus, but there's no charge for initial assessment and perhaps for a short uh, stint of brief therapy. We offer individuals, couples, families, and even single session therapy that is actually very popular. There are drop-in groups, they cover mindfulness topics, parent support. Uh, we do have specialty groups for black men, for example. Um, take a look at our, there's a statement about uh, recent anti anti-Asian uh, violence on the Counseling Center page. Um, and traditionally, there are all kinds of events that we do when there are um, major national, international events or local events happening. There's an after hours telephone service. We offer all kinds of peer programs, workshop series. Um, we do absolutely see graduate students and we welcome graduate students into the Counseling Center. Um, we also have Disability Services Center. Some of you are coming to grad school with uh, disabilities that you're aware of, perhaps some learning differences. We wanna definitely help you succeed at UCI. Testing accommodations, assistive technology, note takers, readers, scribes, interpreters. Uh, if you happen to break your leg or break your arm, um, we can also accommodate uh, the temporary accommodations that you might uh, need as well. And there's lots of disability awareness events, ally programs as you learn how to teach. Uh, students with disabilities as well. I'm going quick. Let's do the next slide. Okay, Student Health Center. Um, so many of you will have a student health insurance if you uh, accept uh, UCI insurance. 
Visits are billed to your insurance like they would be to any doctor you might see. We have board certified medical professionals with expertise in all kinds of uh, health issues. On-site labs, so if you are sent for lab work, it's really within the same building. Uh, radiology, pharmacy within the building. Um, certainly, it, you know, again, we have some ph phenomenal medical resources in the area. If you need to be referred off campus, we can do that as well. We've been doing a lot of telehealth this year since we have been remote also in the counseling center as well. And so if you, for whatever reason, need to schedule an 8 a.m. appointment, doesn't require you being physically seen, we can arrange that for you. Uh, the care office oversees um, a lot of the work having to do with sexual assault, intimate partner violence, uh, relationship abuse, stalking, uh, but it's not just for people who are survivors. We have um, holistic healing programming, yoga, partner retreats to again, learn how to engage in healthy relationships, peer programs, all kinds of campus awareness programs you can get involved with if you are a, um, an advocate of anti-violence programming. All right, next slide. Thank you so much. Campus recreation, uh, for our entire campus community, faculty, staff, and students, you have access to the gym already through your student fees. Um, there are fees for certain specialty classes, specialty cooking classes, for example, or fitness classes. We have an indoor facility with um, weight rooms and a track and a rock wall and a demo kitchen and massage therapy and all kinds of things. And we uh, we have been open during the pandemic, during parts of the pandemic, and a lot of our equipment is outdoors. By the time you get here, I suspect that we will be um, fully up and operational. Um, and we have a robust outdoor facilities program as well. Um, the Center for Student Wellness and Health Promotion. Again, free is the word I want to share with you about this. All kinds of consultations and support, alcohol and other drugs, sexual and relationship health, mental, emotional well-being. A lot of those things that are actually really important for your wellness, nutrition consultations, all that stuff is offered for free. We really want graduate students to take advantage of that. Next slide really for you, many of you are coming to campus with children. And so we do want you to know that we do offer five childcare facilities, uh, everything from infants and toddlers, preschool age children, and then for five to 12 year olds, after school care. Uh, many of our services are subsidized. If you are a graduate student, you can apply for a subsidy. Um, but it is um, really, my own child was uh, at ECEC for several years. so. I'm not just kind of the president, I'm a member as well, right? So, um, and the campus social worker, again, for you, but also for the students that you'll be teaching, services are entirely free. And the social workers, they work with the entire campus to provide support. Those are things like food security, housing security, if you're having difficulty with the landlord, having difficulty with the relationship with your advisor, perhaps, and you want a social worker. Uh, if you are sick or injured or you're in the hospital and and maybe you need some support smoothing over a relationship because you missed some work, uh, we can talk to you. We also offer a lot of online resources to connect you with local supports in the community. And last slide, I think I'll just say, I'll share briefly, briefly about system-wide wellness efforts. When you join a UCI family, obviously we, we want you to prefer us over other schools, but do know that we take advantage of our partnerships across the system so that I'm in connection with my peers around, I do threat assessment for the university. Um, and so we also always share best practices. We are a part of a system-wide healthy campus network. Um, I won't talk too much about this today, but um, we are really working on uh, adopting something in Canada called the Okanagan Charter. Really a lot about not just having well students, but having a well campus, a campus that promotes well-being through its systems and structures. We've been talking a lot about in, in this country about kind of systemic well-being and structural issues. It's not, wellness isn't just about personal resilience, but it's about, you know, are you attending a campus that is attending to your needs? Uh, and so I just wanted to, to, to end my little bit of the presentation by saying, you know, obviously we think we have a lot to offer you and we are uh, we'll welcome your, your comments or questions at the end of the presentations. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. I think that's the most comprehensive, quick overview of all the services I've ever seen. And I now want those slides. That was wonderful. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I will hand over to hone in just a little tighter on our professional development services um, that we offer directly through the graduate division, which is a little bit more narrow focus specifically on graduate students uh, and hand it to Kaylee. 
Hey everyone. Um, I first want to echo what Jillian said. Congratulations. Um, getting in at UCI is no small feat. So we're very happy to see you here. Um, in terms of professional development, um, I'm just going to start actually a little bit earlier than that. Usually first or second year students might see me uh, as it relates to fellowships. And that might seem like that's a specific career path, but the skills that you develop with fellowship writing and proposals are really useful outside of academia. Um, one thing to remember is if you can convince someone to give you money for something, that's always going to be a very marketable skill. Um, so that's probably the first intersection that most students would see me at. Um, beyond that, I do work on professional development through our graduate and postdoctoral resource center. Um, Postdoctoral Scholars Resource Center, GPSRC. Um, we partner with the Division of Career Pathways to bring in a career counselor who often will talk about CVs, uh, cover letters, kind of the basics, um, some job search techniques as well. Um, we also partner with uh, GPS STEM, which focuses on career development in uh, STEM fields. Uh, and then some things that we bring in on our own, we have uh, certificate programs focused on mentoring. We have a certificate program that was developed in the last year in coordination and at the request of a student focused on management, um, management beyond the classroom. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunities through the GPSRC. And if you want to be connected with those opportunities, I recommend that you check out our campus groups page. And I asked Derek to go ahead and share that in the chat. If you go to that web page, you may have to create a profile, but um, you can as a community member. And of course, if you're coming to UCI, you should definitely create a profile. Um, we're going to be using that feed a little bit more this year. We're hoping to post videos of some of our previous events. Um, so make sure that you're registering events when you uh, see them. We do often record them and make that available afterward if you still can't make it. Um, and the other thing is that you can connect with me directly through campus groups by setting up a meeting. And I provide both professional development advising as well as fellowship advising. So again, you may be applying to a fellowship in your first year and you might talk to me a little bit about that. You might come back in your last two or three years and wanna to talk to me a little bit about getting a job. Um, so I guess I'll stop there. There's also a lot of good online resources. So come see me in my office or virtually when we, uh, when we can do that. Um, again, congratulations, glad to see you here. Thank you so much. And now um, I'm gonna hand it over to a team of people. Uh, so one of the things that we are most proud of here at UCI is the foresight that we had to build a lot of campus housing and not quite as much as we wish we had built and we're still building more. Uh, but for many of you living in graduate student housing is uh, a huge benefit to you. And so they were kind enough to come and answer questions as well as give quick update on how things are going and so on. I'll hand it over first to their executive director, Tim Trevin, but he does have other folks with him. So he may well introduce some of our other, uh, our other panelists as well. Thanks, Dean Hayes, and indeed I will. Um, but I'll start off just by saying that we too are very excited to have you at UC Irvine. Um, we obviously have a very special relationship with our students because we are um, providing service 24-7, 365. Um, a couple of uh, highlights about our program. We house between 26 and 2,800 grad students. That does not include families and partners all combined. It's usually somewhere around 3,500 bodies that are living in our three grad or actually four grad communities, um, which is Campus Village and Palo Verde, Verano Place and the American Campus Communities uh, um, Complex on East Campus. Um, as Jillian says, we provide a guarantee for students in terminal programs. And for more information about specifically which those are, you can go to our website or contact one of our staff members. But that guarantee right now is a guarantee to normative time minus one year. However, we have put in a proposal just a couple of weeks ago to extend that uh, guarantee to the normative time of your program. So that would carry you through to whatever your program says is normative time. This is a big move for us, which we were very pleased to be able to um, accommodate uh, because we know that it's a stressor for a lot of our students to think about having to move um, in the last year of their program. Um, 
we do, one of the things that have permitted us to do that was the fact that we are building another 1,050 beds. These beds are in our Verano Place complex um, and will be our first high rise housing for uh, our grad students. We'll be housing all single students in this community in four, two, and studio, um, four bedroom, two bedroom, and studio apartments. Um, the reason that they're all single, uh, designed for singles, is because they are um, single bedrooms within a unit. Um, however, this will also permit us to provide more housing in our other communities for families. So by opening this community, we're actually opening up housing, more housing to accommodate everyone. That will open in fall 2022, just a couple of 17 months from now. We're well into construction and we're really excited about this community. It's going to be a really beautiful place to live. Um, I'm actually going to introduce two of the folks that I work with. Gretchen Verdugo, who is our graduate um, housing analyst, and then Joe Harvey, who is the director of one of our communities, Campus Village. We'll start with Joe, and then we'll uh, toss it to Gretchen to introduce themselves and say a little bit about um, how they'll be interfacing with our grad students. So Joe, take it away. <laughs> okay, thank you, Tim. Well, um, welcome everybody. Just like everybody has um, already expressed, uh, it is definitely our privilege and honor to have you be a part of our graduate program, which over the years, um, I've been at UCI for um, just almost 15 years as a director within our housing program. And I've seen our uh, graduate program and the number of students that are choosing to come to UCI just uh, expand dramatically. And we are so happy to see that uh, because you truly make um, our graduate program, what it is today, which is um, it just exceptional. So um, I have, um, like some of you, um, I am not originally from California. <laughs> I'm a transplant. Um, and you will find that uh, what the campus offers as well as the area is um, not to be conceded, but it is pretty much second to none. It is pretty amazing what we have to offer. Um, if you love the outdoors or even the indoors right now, uh, hopefully we'll be outdoors a lot more <laughs> soon. Uh, we have pretty much anything you can ask for. So um, that uh, coupled with the academic programs uh, that are a part of the graduate program really kind of help us in housing direct the program that we are responsible for and helping you both personally and academically move forward. And that's what we're all about. So um, with that, I'm gonna actually pass it on to Gretchen. So Gretchen, it's all yours. Hi, I actually already had contact with some of you and I serve as the analyst in graduate and family housing. I'm responsible for making sure that each of you receives your guaranteed housing offer and your renewal each year. And um, in grad and family housing, we've continued to house grad students through the pandemic and we're looking to welcome you on campus in a much more normalized fashion. We're we're confident about and hopeful about that. So anything that you need, um, my contact is gradstatus at housing.hsdg.uci.edu. And I'm available for any questions that you have. Um, a lot of information can be found on the website. Um, our application deadline is May 1st, and um, I look forward to the opportunity to work with all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gretchen. And I just want to say thank you to all of you that are typing in questions into the chat. Uh, we're not ignoring them. In some cases, people have already uh, answered them in chat, but we will also answer them live. Uh, I just want to get through introductions before we start answering. So thank you for, uh, for asking them. And thank you to the panelists who are already answering them as we're going through this. Uh, we're doing quick service here today. Um, 
Last introduction for the day, um, Ruth Quinnen, who uh, is in charge of all of the academic and uh, student services and so on in the graduate division, who is also going to answer one of your questions. Uh, so we'll do a twofer with her opening remarks and answering a, an important question that came through already. Well, hi, everybody. Um, we're delighted that you're here and delighted that you've chosen to come to UCI. I'd like to echo others in congratulating you, and we're so happy that you're going to be at our campus and with us. Um, I'm Ruth Quinnen, the Executive Director of Student and Academic Affairs for the Graduate Division, and I oversee a lot of different areas. Um, we provide a lot of services for students. We work with all of the offices that are represented here um, to help basically solve student problems and address any issues that you have. Um, I work closely with the housing office to help students that are having issues with student health, um, with the social worker, with Marcel's office. Um, to basically help students. So we're kind of a, a centralized unit that provides help for students in with any kind of issue. Um, you know, if you're having issues with your advisor, um, you know, we, we ask that you come to us and talk to us. We have an academic counselor in our office, Dr. Fang Luong, who is very good at um, talking with students, helping them work through issues. Um, he also gives a lot of workshops for students on things like imposter syndrome, time management, um, you know, wellness and health. Um, and he's wonderful. He also can facilitate conversations between students and their advisors, walk students through having difficult conversations with advisors or others, um, you know, and really a lot of it is balancing, you know, balancing your time, balancing your work and your health and wellness. Um, while you're going through graduate school, it is a really stressful thing, um, you know, and we'd like it to be as good of an academic and personal experience as possible for you. Um, we, I, I also oversee academic um, initiatives, which uh, Selena Mojica is the director for, and that actually oversees the counselor, the development of new graduate programs. Um, she works very closely with faculty on that. She also heads up uh, retention of students who are here and has a number of programs to help students out and you know make sure that you're happy and are getting a lot out of things and because we want you to stay once you've come we really want you to stay and get your degree and have a great experience um i also oversee enrolled student services which basically kind of tracks students and and provides assistance throughout your academic career in terms of status um you know if you have to go part-time for some reason or go on a leave of absence or you're advancing to candidacy which is really exciting um we help we are assist with all of those things and process that and make sure that everything's reflected in campus systems appropriately and at the end of the day we actually are the office that confers your degree. Uh, the person in our office who actually does that is Andrea Banigan. She's the manager of enrolled services and she's wonderful. She, all of us, all of our staff and grad division are here to help you. We're here to answer questions, provide resources for you or referrals to campus resources or even off campus resources. So um, that's basically my role is overseeing a variety of those things, but I get personally involved all the time with students and issues and trying to help them out in, you know, any way I can, whether it's a financial issue and they're, you know, wondering where their funding's coming from, um, or they're having financial aid issues, all of those things. So I'm always available to help out students or to provide resources, referrals, and everything else. <laughs> Uh, let's see, there were a couple of questions. I think the in-state residency question is, the, is a big one that could use your expertise. So if you are a domestic student, um, once you've been in California for a year, you can establish California residency, which then uh, discontinues the non-resident supplemental tuition that you're charged. So yes, if you've been in California for a year, there are a variety of things that you have to do in order to establish residency. I think one is registering to vote in California, getting a driver's license, getting a bank account. There's, there's a variety of things. And we have a um, person on campus who is responsible for that. And that, that is called the residence deputy. And that person is in the registrar's office. 
So let me, I will post their email address in the chat so that you can contact him with specific questions. But yes, the short answer is yes. Fantastic. Thank you, Ruth. So while Ruth's uh, popping that in before I call on folks, let me answer a couple of questions that came in early. One is about summer classes. Uh, so right now, graduate programs, assuming that we stay at a similar public health risk level that we are at now, graduate courses can be in person. We have about 60 classes being taught in person at the graduate level for spring quarter. And we expect that number to be somewhat similar actually in summer. You would think it might go up, but actually because we teach fewer classes in the summer, we, we think it'll stay somewhat similar. Uh, the MAT program, I know we've got a lot of our future teachers or current teachers on our call today. Uh, they are planning for summer session one courses for their graduating cohort to be in person, but for their incoming cohort to be online. Summer session two courses, they are planning for those to be in person. Uh, so hopefully that sort of covers that. Definitely talk to your individual programs if you have concerns. We have asked the programs that even if they are offering in-person over the summer, because as people are sort of trying to get here, move here, deal with vaccination schedules, all the things that you're dealing with in your uh, various uh, areas and lives right now, that they do provide accommodation to be remote in the summer. In the fall, we are not requiring that. Uh, so the expectation is that you will be able to be here in the fall. Obviously we'll revisit that if things change and, and you're not able to be here, but that's the expectation. But for the summer, we're being intentionally a bit more flexible. Also related to the, our teachers, uh, the question about student teaching. Currently, there are some schools in Orange County that are already in person. And so student teachers are able to work virtual or in person, depending on sort of a variety of factors. We anticipate schools are going to be largely in person come fall. Uh, so that's kind of where we're at with student teaching. Other practica have been more mixed. Our clinical practica, for those of you who are, say, in nursing or public health, those have by and large remained in person even throughout this time period. Uh, other things like legal clinics have been more mixed with some courts going virtual and some not. So it's, it's pretty variable. If you have specific questions about your program, I would definitely encourage you to reach out to folks uh, about that. Okay, so we've got a few housing questions. I know we're all surprised by that. Uh, just kidding, we always get a ton of housing questions. Uh, so let me see. Uh, there's a question about where do students live when they don't live in student housing and do we have any matchmaking services? I think the first part of that question, perhaps uh, Tim or Gretchen could answer, but then maybe Connor, if you could weigh in from the student perspective, that would be wonderful. Yeah, I'll start off uh, just by saying that we do have a resource on our website called the Anteater Housing Network um, that connects students with uh, resources in the community for off-campus housing. We have folks in the community who are looking to rent apartments, rooms, um, other looking for roommates uh, that that will help to pair you with housing. Um, the other resource is that we do have every spring a um, housing an off-campus housing fair. It's mostly uh, a support for students who are continuing students, but if you are in the area and are interested in uh, the resource, um, please reach out. We're able to connect you with that as well. Gretchen and Joe, do you have anything to add to that? I don't. No, that is um, that is the primary source that we have for residents is, is through our, our Ant Eater Housing Network. Um, however, um, if you have any questions, you are more than welcome to contact any of the housing communities, Campus Village, Palo Verde, or Verano Place, um, and we are more than willing to talk to you individually and kind of um, try to work something out for you and give you the, the direction that you best fits your situation. One more thing that I'll mention is that historically we've had a lot of our grad students who have lived in the university town center area, which is just north of the university walking distance. Um, and we have received word from the management of those communities that they will have much less availability this year than they have in the past. 
Um, and so it's going to be difficult to find housing in the immediate walkable area. So what we're telling students is you will probably want to heavily consider taking your guarantee offer if you have one. You're always welcome at the end of the first year to uh, not renew and move off as you get to know the area better. But this is probably a transitional resource that will be even more important this year than in past years. Connor, anything to add to that as a from an actual student experience? Sure. No, that, that that's that's um, right on the money. In terms of sort of if you're if you don't live uh, on campus, and, and as Tim mentioned, you know over the years, you know whether um, people are um, you know lo looking to come into a sort of larger apartments, or they want to go places where they might be you know adjunct faculty somewhere, or they, you know maybe they want to you know find like a you know micro studio somewhere on the beach, somewhere go to the mountains. You know there are a lot of people who go all over. I think within. The, particularly the first couple of years, if they're not on campus, they tend to be within um, within closer proximity and, and it tends to be a little bit more inland as well, where it's a little bit more affordable. So places like Costa Mesa, Santa Ana, like tend to be uh, places where you'll see that as the year goes on, people make friends, people have um, more and more ties to the broader area. Uh, places like Long Beach, uh, maybe about half an hour north or so, um, is, is one of the areas that has um, a larger concentration of students. And as you go through those areas, if you whether that's now or in the future, are looking at those places, um, UCI Transportation also has uh, carpool programs. So you can look to carpool uh, with other graduate students, faculty and staff as well. So that way you can make any uh, commute that you might be doing a little bit more fun too. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, there's also some other question, housing questions about um, maybe if you could just speak a little bit to what is what is the likelihood that people have of getting an apartment on their own? What is sort of the roommate matching process look like? Um, those are sort of the, the types of questions in there. Just a little bit more about what they're about to experience when they, once they get their housing applications in. Yeah, I'll actually toss that to Gretchen because Gretchen works very directly with those kinds of uh, questions and, and resources. Yeah, I'm happy to. So in the housing application, you're going to rank for us what your top preferences are for communities and floor plans, as well as letting us know about your domestic status so that we can match you up that way. Um, and then in addition to that, um, we will ask you to identify any preferred roommate. Both you and your pr preferred roommate will identify one another in the comments to your housing application so that our assignment staff and they read every single one of those um, can do their best to match you with your preferred roommate. Thank you so much, Gretchen. And while we've got you off mute, I've got another um, that I'm pretty sure is a you question, um, which is, can you talk a little bit about the wait list for grad housing? I know we've got a lot of folks on the call who don't have guaranteed housing. So those of you who are not in terminal degree programs, you probably do not have a guarantee. That doesn't mean you can't get housing. You should certainly apply, um, but you are likely to be placed on a wait list. So if we can talk a little bit about that, that would be great. Yeah, so I would encourage everyone who does not have a housing guarantee to apply to the waitlist now. And we place um, the students from the waitlist by category. So um, that information is actually on the website, um, which students fall into category one and category two. But your application completed date is important as well. That's what holds your place in lines. And once you apply to the wait list, you'll get to keep your place in line um, by reapplying. Um, and you won't lose that place in line until you actually get a wait list offer. So as apartments become available, we reach out to people on the wait list um, based on that category and application completed date. So so questions about the wait list as well that might be more specific than that, feel free to reach out to me directly and um, I'd be happy to answer them. 
Thank you so much. Let's let, let's let housing have a little break and we'll answer some other questions uh, quickly. So we do have a question about our undocumented students. Um, I'm going to make the question a little broader than what the asker asked, which was uh, what support, what financial support do we have for DACA students and uh, uh, create a, a space for perhaps Marcel and I both to answer more broadly how we support undocumented students on our campus. Uh, first of all, from a funding standpoint, if you are admitted to a PhD program that comes with a funding guarantee, we are committed to meeting that guarantee regardless of your documentation status. How we do that depends on a variety of things. Obviously, if you're DACA, we have ability to hire you into traditional student employment categories like teaching assistantships, graduate research assistantships, and so on. If you do not have DACA, but you have a B540 status, meaning you graduated high school here in California, we have some different fellowship options and so on. And some of you may be aware that there is a law that is sunsetting currently in the California legislature called SB 77, which may cause us some problems. If you are nervous about that specific law, I want to really encourage you to reach out. You can email grad at uci.edu and we will set some time to have a phone call or a Zoom appointment with you just to talk about what's happening there. Um, for our master's students who maybe don't have funding guarantees, again, if you are DACA, you can still absolutely apply for teaching assistantships and other things, and so can our international students, and so can our other domestic students who are uh, perhaps didn't come with a funding guarantee, those of you that are in master's programs and so on, you can absolutely apply for all of those assistantships. Anytime you are hired at at least 25% time, you do get tuition remission, which is your tuition and fees covered. I know that was a question we had earlier. Uh, so we do really encourage you to apply for all of those things. Um, with that, can I hand it over, Marcel? Do you feel comfortable talking about our undocumented resources more broadly? So that is not, yeah, it's not in my area. It's actually in the Ramin's <laughs> area. So, but there is a dream, you know, we do have a UCI Dream Center um, and there's all kinds of events there. They are currently working remotely, right? As most of us are. Um, but there is someone who's there to talk about, um, you know, all kinds of issues, mentoring, reviewing essays, resumes, CVs. Um, so there's a there's a resource there. Um, there are there's lots that we do for um, for undergraduates to, so that students can get kind of um, uh, work experience without. But it's uh, part of an academic program. So uh, I don't want to talk too much about something that, that doesn't report to me. But um, but there are lots of uh, opportunities available to uh, learn about how to support undocumented students. And if you happen to be one yourself. Yes, and please do reach out. Um, Connor, do you want to speak to the AGS efforts? Sure. Yeah. So some of the things um, we've done with the Dream Center, or that the Dream Center does as well for uh, for for grads in particular, but some of this also has a lot of overlap with the ways in which they support um, the undergraduates. Is uh, in addition to sort of helping with um, any sort of sort of filing or or sort of reapplications or things like that, which they are like a profoundly helpful resource. They've also started uh, new programs over the past couple of years uh, to provide um, sort of uh, fellowship opportunities. So for folks who are looking to do internship work or, th um, or you know, things either on campus or off campus, um, and there might be situations which that sort of getting um, Paid, paid for those opportunities or, or uh, sort of finding a place where you feel safe and secure. They do a lot of really wonderful opportunities to make sure people are finding meaningful and um, gainfully employing um, professional development opportunities too. Great, thank you so much. Um, lots of great questions coming in. We're technically supposed to end in 15 minutes, but I am committed to staying here and we will try to answer more questions. Some of our panelists may have hard stops at four, so I'm gonna go ahead and allow them to drop off if they need to at four. Uh, but in the meantime, um, let's see if we can get a little more detail. All of you asking financial aid questions, I don't have anyone here from financial aid. So if you are talking about FAFSAs or other things, Ruth can give you a quick um, overview, but the more detailed questions on financial aid, I'm gonna always tell you, please reach out to the financial aid office. Um, but Ruth, why don't you see where we're at more broadly? Um, I know financial aid is working on, um, you know, packages for students. They're working on a number of things, uh, one of which is they're still working on packages for our current students for spring. I think they start re releasing their aid packages pretty soon. I want to say in April, but I actually did email the director of financial aid, and I'm hoping she gets back to me while we're still on the call. 
Um, but yeah, I would, I would certainly encourage you to talk to financial aid to contact them directly. I realize sometimes they are hard to get a hold of. They do deal with tens of thousands of students. So, um, you know, I would encourage you to please be patient with them. They will get back to you. Um, but yeah, I am hoping to hear back from the director while we're still on this um, town hall. They are slightly backed up even compared to their usual terrible backed upness because of the federal uh, funds that just came in. Um, that we are trying to get back out the door ideally this week. Um, Connor, I know your constituents are eagerly awaiting uh, those funds, um, but that is sort of an extra workload that got thrown on them at the time that they are the busiest to try to get your packages out the door. So apologies for the delay. Um, they are gonna go through them as fast as possible. If you have not filed your FAFSA and are hoping to get financial aid through us, do it um, is yes. after this call, do it right now. Uh, you definitely wanna get in that queue because as we get closer to the fall term, I know many times our undergraduate students come back and need to be what's called repackaged uh, and it really buries them once again. So you really wanna get in that queue uh, if at all possible. Um, so well, and yeah, the, the earlier, the better, because it is somewhat first come first serve. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a question about how you know if you have guaranteed housing or not. Uh, if you are a PhD student, you do. Uh, if you are an MFA student, you do. Um, who am I missing? JDs? JDs do have it. They have a guarantee for, I think it's the whole three years. Tim, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, right. And then also MD PhD students um, mm -hmm. who apply for their MD degree as well as their PhD at the same time, they have um, a guarantee. The one caveat I will say is that students must be admitted and have responded to housing prior to or by the May 1st deadline. That is housing's deadline for responses from students. Um, your offer letter from your program, if you're a PhD, MFA, et cetera, student should state that you have a guaranteed offer of housing. Um, and if you are a PhD or MFA student whose offer letter does not state that, please contact your program immediately. And let me yes. piggyback on that and just reiterate the importance of applying by May 1st. Um, if you uh, are planning to do so, we really are really, it's, it's a very important deadline that we have to stick with. Uh, and so please just take advantage of that. Thank you so much. Um, Tim or Gretchen or Joe, if I could get one of you to type into the um, chat, perhaps uh, there's a question about where the actual applications are for housing. And I know those are online somewhere. So if you don't mind dropping that URL, in for folks, you just uh, apply for housing. If you know that you're going to be a waitlist type person, there's not a specific waitlist application. You just apply for housing. The waitlist is just where, where we're putting it on the backside. And speaking of applications, we've got great questions coming in a few about how do we apply for research or teaching assistantships. If you are interested in becoming a teaching assistant, the first thing to make sure you do is when you arrive to campus in the fall, be sure that you uh, that you register for the TA training uh, because you will need to go through that before you'll be able to be hired as a teaching assistant. And then make sure your program knows. If you're a PhD student, the likelihood is you're gonna TA whether you want to or not. But if you are a master's student who's interested, many times programs want to find more TAs and they want to hire folks, but they uh, don't necessarily know that you're interested. So make sure that your grad program chair, probably someone who's been emailing with you about your acceptance, make sure they know uh, that you are interested. And as far as research assistantships go, those are very much brokered sort of on an individual basis with individual faculty. So if you take a class with someone that you really like, or you've been reading their research before you arrive here, reach out to them. They may have assistantships uh, available for folks uh, and so on. Um, so let's see. I wanna make sure we get all the housing ones Good, because I know housing folks have 4 p.m. hard stops. Um, so uh, one question I know that is top to Tim's mind right now, but I don't think we have an answer for, is uh, what's happening with quarantine housing. We have been holding a decent amount of housing for our quarantine um, students, and I believe we're in the process of possibly releasing some of that, maybe, uh, but I don't know, Tim, if you can speak to that at all. 
Yeah, we are absolutely committed to having the right number of quarantine and isolation spaces in our campus housing stock for the 21-22 academic year. We had far more spaces than we needed this year. Um, and that was by design. We wanted to make sure that we were prepared for any kind of surge that might happen. Um, next year, knowing that we have far more undergrads and grads who are going to want to live on campus, we're really trying to balance between the need of um, providing housing uh, for students and also having the right number of quarantine isolation spaces. We are working with our public health folks to model um, what that might look like based on vaccination rates, based on CDC recommendations. Um, and as Jillian said, we will be reducing the number this year to give you an exact number. We were around 700 quarantine isolation spaces. The most we ever used at one time was 58. So we were happy to have the additional 650 spaces, but they weren't necessary. Next year, we're looking at reducing that um, significantly, probably in the 200 to 300 range, which will still be far more than we need, but we'll be prepared. So that's what we're looking for. The coin of the realm this year and next year is safety and preparedness. And we're not gonna take any risks with, um, with student wellness or our own wellness, frankly. Thank you so much for that, absolutely. Um, we do have a question that I'm again gonna expand slightly from what the asker asked, which is why don't we uh, do guaranteed housing for our master's students? And the reason is a simple one, it's capacity. We simply don't have enough physical housing. And so some prioritization has to be made. Um, you could make all kinds of arguments about why this is the wrong prioritization, or maybe we should have a different one, but it is the one that a variety of task forces have come to. Uh, as Tim mentioned at the beginning, we are building as fast as we possibly can and as fast as we can afford to and the regions will allow us and all of that. Um, and we hope to be able to open up more guaranteed housing for more folks uh, over time, but it's a continual sort of race between growth of the university and our ability to build additional housing. Um, but I wanna expand that slightly because I know sometimes for our master's students, particularly our more professionally oriented master's students, you may feel like, gosh, they're always talking about these PhD students and they don't really care about me. I wanna make sure you know that we really do care about you. We are looking to expand career services. We are looking to expand a variety of um, things that we provide to you across the campus to ensure that our professional students are getting just as good of an experience as our PhD students and other folks. Um, Connor, I don't know if you wanna speak at all to the way in which you've made strides within your cabinet to be more inclusive of master's students. Sure, absolutely. So one of the things we know, whether you're in a one-year master's or, or a two-year program, or even the, the three with uh, some of the MFAs, um, is sort of getting in, sort of getting your bearings, you know, le learning the campus, learning the area, sort of doing your coursework, and then, you know, moving on. It, time flies. Um, so one of the things we've tried to do um, is over the past couple of years, including this year, we've um, doubled the amount of sort of paid student staff we have to work uh, on a variety of different issues in support of a variety of different student communities, um, whether they you know those are international student engagement or um, like LGBTQ uh, engagement chair. Uh, we, we have a variety, variety of different things like that that's really helped us allow to sort of make sure we're meeting the folks where they are. And many of those students, because we'll do, uh, AGS does hiring for those things in the fall, allows for master students to really kind of get in um, and then sort of get connected with opportunities and things like that um, as they're sort of getting their bearings and, and sort of learning the campus and things like that too. So there'll be plenty of opportunities to, uh, to make sure that we, in addition to all the stuff that uh, the many, many events that, you know, Kaylee puts on or that, you um, that AGS on that we that you you can hit the ground running um, in in full stride in the fall and doesn't shouldn't shouldn't matter what your degree status is. Thank you so much. I don't know if anyone else wants to add to that. Um, pause for a moment. I'll just add that um, at the graduate and postdoctoral scholar resource center, our events are open to master's students as are individual consulting. Um, I do find that master's students departments seem to be a little bit more connected with um, employers often. Um, so a lot of times you're getting a lot of resources from your department in terms of professional development. That being said, in graduate division, if there's, if there's professional development that you're not getting in your department, um, that's the kind of gap that graduate division is here to kind of help with. 
Um, so you can always request additional programs if you're not seeing what you like. Um, and yeah, just make sure to check out what we do have offered. It, it should all be open to you. Uh, and let me just ask one more quick one of the housing folks. Uh, the ACC and the UCI proper housing, is that one application or two? We've got a question about how to do that. Yeah, uh, Gretchen, you want to answer that one? I, my connection was not good during that question. Can you just repeat your question real quick and I'm happy to take it. Sure, absolutely. If they're interested in both ACC and our um, more uh, traditional on-campus housing, how do they apply for both or can they make a preference of one or the other? Thank you for that. So you just need to apply for, through the graduate and family housing website. And then if you're matched with an ACC community, they'll provide you with their application at that time. So you just need to apply through the graduate and family housing website and you'll be notified and contacted by your housing community once you're matched. Thank you so much. And we've gotten a variety of other questions, things like, well, if I have a disability, even if I don't have guaranteed housing, or if I have a family, even if I don't have guaranteed housing, or if I have this or that or whatever, can I get housing? Apply. The answer is always apply. Give the housing folks as much information uh, as you can. Um, and uh, please do give them the chance to, to look at your, your application materials and see what's in there. Uh, you should always apply, you never know. Sometimes we have spots open up um, even mid-year uh, and surprising and so on. Um, okay, we have so, jammed hey, through. Gary, oh, sorry, hey, go Gary, ahead. Can, can I uh, jump in here real quick on that? Um, definitely apply. Also, if you are, um, if you have like an emotional support animal or, or disability services animal or any of that nature that you are wanting to bring to campus, along with applying for housing, we absolutely encourage you to contact our disability services department and start working with them as soon as possible um, because uh, we work closely with them on their direction. So that's another key that uh, we'd like you to follow up through as well. Absolutely. Thank you. I know we've got a variety of international student questions that we didn't quite get to today. So I want to encourage you all. There is another town hall uh, that is coming up and that is more focused on international students. Uh, and so obviously those of you who are from the US, you can come to that one just as some international students came today. But that one will be, we will also have some specific folks there from the International Center and other folks that can answer those international student specific kinds of questions. Um, so I can't believe we did it, but we managed to get through 53 questions uh, in the last half hour. So thank you to the panelists for a lightning round on all of that. Um, if you take nothing else from this town hall, please take the email address grad at uci.edu. That's G-R-A-D at uci.edu. It is a shared mailbox monitored by a bunch of my staff and someone will route you to the right place if you have a question. We are very happy to answer all of those things. Um, and uh, no, Cody, a car will not, a lack of a car will not help you prioritize housing, but don't worry, it's a, the most bikeable city in America or something. We've gotten that award many times, so you'll be fine. Uh, we don't have subways, unfortunately, but we, uh, we do uh, have bikes. So hooray, 54 questions. All right. I wanna give a huge round of applause to all of our wonderful panelists and also you town hall attendees. This is the best set of questions I think we've had for any of our town halls. We've been doing these for a year during COVID. Please come back and see us again. We so hope to see you here in the fall. Uh, and for those of you that are in uh, mostly remote programs, we hope to see you online in the fall, but uh, we, we love to meet you in person as well. So thank you all so much for being here. Reach out with any additional questions. Um, and I don't know, panelists, should we do a little zot? Are we ready for it? There we go, all right. Uh, so those of you that are incoming, you'll have to learn to zot. We're very proud of our anteater here. Uh, thank you all so much and uh, have a great afternoon.